a custom-made table with high-end light fixtures hovering above, a designer blue lacquered desk in the study. In the living room, a velvet upholstered sofa with vintage armchairs. This, according to the website ldecor.com, is the apartment in Manhattan's Upper East Side occupied by Ivanka Trump and her husband Jared Kushner, an apartment they may soon be vacating. Tonight, CNN has learned Kushner and Ivanka Trump are house hunting in Washington. Specifically, what are they going to have to do regarding security at a place like this or a condo? They're going to have several Secret Service cars lined up probably in front and behind the property. Um, they may have some sort of um, occasional aerial uh, monitoring as well. Realtor Allison Goodhart has sold homes in Washington's exclusive Calorama neighborhood. Average price, she says, four to ten million dollars. Are they in for some complaints from neighbors almost no matter where they go? With security and gawkers? It's likely there might be some complaints. It depends on the neighborhood they choose. I think there are certain neighborhoods where they are used to um, high-profile Republicans and Democrats coming in. Another important factor in their home search, Jared Kushner is an Orthodox Jew. Ivanka Trump converted to Judaism. Their family strictly observes the Sabbath and may want to be within walking distance from an Orthodox synagogue in the city. The most upscale condo in D.C.? This suite in the Ritz-Carlton in Georgetown on sale for $12 million. Tonight, questions also persist about what role Kushner will have in the Trump administration. He's expected to serve as an advisor to his father-in-law. Kushner was seen walking with White House Chief of Staff Dennis McDonough on the White House grounds during Donald Trump's meeting with President Obama. Steve Bannon and Reince Priebus, who will be the strategic advisor and the Chief of Staff, also want Jared badly because he's such a good mediator between their different styles and their different positions. Questions also linger tonight about how Ivanka Trump might balance her role as an executive VP of the Trump Organization with whatever she does in Washington. That role could also be controversial. Melania Trump plans on staying in New York with their son Barron at least until the spring. Because Melania will not be here until after Barron finishes the school year, I think that there will be a lot of pressure on Ivanka to perform kind of a de facto first lady role. Obviously, all of these experts of and smart did. people were all proven wrong because they didn't realize this was not an election. What was it? This was a movement. This was a peaceful it. takeover of government by the people. people. And believe me when I tell you something, Donald Trump is going to drain the swamp. What does drain the swamp mean, Tony, to you? I feel that it's like cleaning up the corruption that goes on, the good old boys club, where they're putting their own needs and wants and uh, money making ahead of the people, what the people want. They don't listen to what we want That's or right. how we feel or um, things that concern us. They, uh, as soon as we give an opinion, they, they're the first to, to put us down. I mean, obviously what Hillary said, the basket of deplorable, deplorables. There are good people that support Trump all across America. Oh, yeah. And we don't hate any, anybody. Obviously, General Flynn is under a lot of pressure, uh, but frankly, he's a done deal. He's likely going to be the next national security advisor because um, he doesn't need to be confirmed by, by the Senate. Betsy, your take on the fact that not only does he still have this tweet about a conspiracy theory, totally fake news story that he tweeted in November about Hillary Clinton, still up on his Twitter account, this one, his son also on Sunday night, after an armed man went into the D.C. pizza shop and, and sh fired shots because of another fake news story, Flynn's son and his chief of staff said, until Pizzagate is proven to be false, it remains a story. The left seems to forget Podesta emails and the many coincidences tied to it. Let's listen, guys, to Joe Scarborough on MSNBC this morning asking the vice president-elect, Mike Pence, about uh, General Flynn and about specifically about his his son, who we just talked about with that fake news tweet, who, who is his, his chief of staff. Let's listen to what Pence said. Well, General Flynn's son has no involvement in the transition whatsoever. He has uh, a transition email. Well, General, uh, well, he has no involvement in the transition whatsoever. Not General, at all. General Flynn is uh, let, let, let me a ask you that again. member of our I, team. I just and, want to underline that. So, to work so, you, so you're running the transition, right? I am. I'm chairing it. Uh, you were no, saying as the head of the transition that Flynn's son is not involved at all in no. the transition. No, okay. he's not. Okay, so Patricia, do you, here's the thing, as Joe Scarborough rightly pointed out, and as the New York Times is reporting today, uh, his son has a .gov transition e email address. Now, Pence is saying he's no longer involved. What do you make of all of it? 
Uh, well, I think it's uh, Mike Pence, again, being a loyal soldier and uh, being loyal to Donald Trump. I do think we're starting to see a relatively troubling trend of uh, Mike Pence and other members of the administration saying uh, what they need to say. Uh, it damages their credibility enormously. If we start to find out that General Flynn's son does have a role in the transition, we don't know how he got his email address. It may have just been a request uh, that was fulfilled uh, in kind of a very busy time for the transition team. Um, but for General Flynn to be uh, not coming out and denouncing these stories and for his son to not be coming out and denouncing these stories, it damages the credibility of a man who must have full confidence, uh, not just of the president, but of the general public. Today at Trump Tower, Mr. Moore, can you come to the camera? former Vice President Al Gore sitting down with the president-elect and Ivanka Trump to talk about Gore's signature so issue, climate change, something uh, Trump Ivanka has called a hoax. Uh, the bulk of the time was with uh, President-elect Donald Trump. Uh, I, I found it an, an extremely interesting conversation uh, and uh, to be continued. The president-elect also reaching out to a former rival, picking Dr. Ben Carson as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. We're excited to have Dr. Carson uh, as our uh, intended nominee uh, for uh, Housing and Urban Development. We're looking forward to another very productive week in the transition that's setting a historic pace. Carson, a neurosurgeon, lacked significant well, experience in housing sure, and urban gentlemen. development. During the primary, he criticized housing regulations to address segregation in public housing. This is what you see in communist countries, where they have so many regulations encircling every aspect of your life that if you don't agree with them, all they have to do is pull the noose. And this is what we've got now. As one cabinet selection moves forward, another seems to be taking a step back. Trump is now expanding his search for a secretary of state after narrowing his list to four contenders last week. Transition sources now say former Utah governor and ambassador to China John Huntsman is in the mix. As is ExxonMobil CEO Rex Tillerson and West Virginia Democratic Senator Joe Manchin, according to the New York Times. Former CIA Director David Petraeus, also still in the running, expressing regret for mishandling classified information. I apologize for it. I paid a very heavy price for it, and I've learned from it. Uh, and again, they'll have to factor that in, and also obviously 38 and a half years of, of otherwise uh, fairly, in some cases, unique service to our country in uniform and at the CIA. Meantime, the president-elect's use of Twitter grabbing the attention of Saturday Night Live. Kellyanne, I just retweeted the best tweet. I mean, wow, what a great, smart tweet. We're in a security briefing. I know, but this could not wait. Trump slamming the show as unwatchable, totally biased, not funny, and the Baldwin impersonation just can't get any worse. Sad and blasting the media on Twitter today, saying, quote, if the press would cover me accurately and honorably, I would have far less reason to tweet. Mike Pence defending another Trump tweet in which he claimed that millions of illegal votes were cast in the presidential election. It's his right to express his opinion as a president-elect of the United States. I think one of the things that's refreshing about our president-elect it was just a phone call at this point. It signals the fact that he accepted a congratulatory call. President-elect Trump is not out there making policy or announcing new policy prescriptions worldwide. The response from the Chinese government in the aftermath of this call has primarily been to ratchet up the rhetoric against Taiwan. And it's unclear to me how that kind of consequence benefits the people of Taiwan. Uh, I've been involved in this relationship for a lot of years, and this is the first time I've ever seen a real business person uh, who understands leverage uh, and understands a fair deal and a level playing field. John Huntsman perhaps playing for Secretary of State as he gets ready for his own interview. He's one of the on a long list, expanding list. We'll get into that in just a minute, but the, the phone call between the president-elect and the president of Taiwan, a congratulatory call uh, prompted all this reaction. And Donald Trump uh, on Twitter uh, kind of reacting to China's reaction. Did China ask of us if it was okay to devalue their currency, making it hard for our companies to compete, heavily tax our products? Going into their country, the U.S. doesn't tax them, or to build a massive military complex in the middle of South China Sea? I don't think so. Now, there are multiple stories that this was a planned shift, and uh, all this hubbub is about nothing.
Let's bring in our panel. Jonah Goldberg, senior editor at National Review. Mara Lyason, national political correspondent of National Public Radio and editor-in-chief of Life Z. Laura Ingram. Jonah, uh, there was a ton of reaction over the weekend. There was, and I, I will say as someone who thinks that Chiang Kai-shek was the rightful ruler of China, not Mao, that I have no problem with uh, the idea of sending this kind of signal, messing with China, uh, starting out strong and all the rest. The problem is, if that was the intent, as the Washington Post story today implies and other reporting backs up, then why were uh, Kellyanne Conway and Mike Pence out there selling a different story? I mean, the messaging behind the decision is schizophrenic. Um, but if, if, if this is part of sort of some strategic ambiguity and all that, we can give them the benefit of the doubt. I have no problem playing hardball with China. But the messaging doesn't back that up. Mark Thiessen, who didn't start out as a big Trump fan, uh, writes, uh, Donald Trump's phone call with the president of Taiwan wasn't a blunder by an inexperienced president-elect, unschooled in the niceties of cross-straits diplomacy. It was a deliberate move and a brilliant one at that. He goes on to say the very idea that Trump could not speak to Taiwan's president because it would anger Beijing is precisely the kind of weak need subservience that Trump promised to eliminate as president and goes on to de defend that. Laura, um, what about the messaging? here. Well, I think Jonah raises a good point. You, you want a unified uh, front on the messaging uh, of this uh, call. I do think it's quite something that the United States is supposed to like check in with China before they take phone calls from world leaders, an ally of ours that, you know, we have the, you know, the Taiwan Relations Act that has been, you know, reconfirmed and re supported again and again every time it comes up for consideration, even in an informal matter. Uh, Democrats, Marco Rubio, others, we always reaffirm our support for Taiwan, uh, our reassurances for Taiwan. I mean, under the uh, Taiwan Relations Act, we could potentially have to militarily intervene if China decides to move against Taiwan. We kind of put that all aside because of our belief in globalization, or at least our former belief in globalization. But this is a serious deal, what's been done and the pressure that has been put on countries in the region, especially the concern about the, the shipping and the transit through that uh, South China Sea. I think Jonah's exactly right. This was a move by Trump to show that, look, there's a new game in town. We're not going to be your patsy anymore. And uh, I, think, I think it's welcomed by most in With the United States. Perhaps more an ex exclamation point on Twitter over the weekend. Yeah, I mean, Donald Trump has said, hey, I did this on purpose. He has presented a tougher posture towards China in all of his tweets. And I agree with Jonah. I don't understand why his spokespeople would go out there and undercut this. Even um, months and months and months ago, Josh, John Bolton, other advisors to Trump, have laid out a argument for why the U.S. should be, get tougher with China by making these steps to be friendlier to Taiwan. In other words, this is a stated, explained policy change um, from the Trump uh, brain trust. And, you know, Barack Obama tried to pivot to Asia and then kind of gave up. But the idea was that China does need to be checked. China is getting to be more of a hegemon in that in that region of the world and we need to to do more there so here's trump doing it i don't know why his people would undercut him on that and welcome back to hannity so the trump transition team remains hard at work trying to fill key administrative roles earlier today president-elect trump he nominated dr benjamin carson as the department of housing and urban development secretary and the president-elect is reportedly now expanding the field of potential Secretary of State nominees sending out more invitations to meet with even more people this week. Back with reaction, former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. He's moving so much faster than past presidents, but he's inviting everybody in. Like, I don't want Mitt Romney chosen because I think you need loyal people around you. Do you agree? I do agree, but I have to say the discipline, the way they're approaching this, you know, they are way ahead of most presidents right now in the number of cabinet slots they've already chosen. And I know there are two or three more coming that they've already gotten locked down, that they know what they're doing. Uh, and here is probably his hardest decision. And I think what's happening as he looks at this, and I really admire the disciplined way he's approached the Secretary of State. Could have picked Rudy Giuliani, certainly my choice. Um, might have picked Mitt Romney, certainly not my choice. But he keeps looking at it, thinking about it, talking to people. Uh, and I think we may discover that the model is what President Eisenhower did. He brought in John Foster Dulles, who was a great international lawyer. He wasn't a theoretician. He wasn't a creature of the State Department of Bureaucracy. But 
He was somebody who had actually worked internationally with big deals, getting things done. I wouldn't be at all surprised to see uh, the president-elect reach out to somebody in business who's run a large multinational, who's used to dealing with many, many different countries, and who brings that tough-minded business approach uh, to the State Department. Because remember, as, and I think you and I totally agree on this, you have to have a Secretary of State who both fixes the State Department while representing the U.S. overseas. They've got to do both jobs, the, the, and I think it's important to have a great manager to do that. I think the bureaucracy, the State Department, that, that's where the swamp that needs to be drained is, or at least a big part of it. Let me, let me ask you about this Taiwan question and, and the media's coverage of this. Now, in 95, the, Bill Clinton let the president of Taiwan give a speech at Cornell. And then when George W. Bush was president, he allowed the president of Taiwan to visit in transit to countries in Latin America that maintain diplomatic relations with Taiwan. You would think this is the, the biggest, I guess, presidential faux pas watching the, the, the news media this weekend because he took a congratulatory phone call from the president of Taiwan. They, you know, Dick Cheney actually made a statement. He said, you know, Trump could now transcend the media. At this point, he doesn't need these guys anymore. Is it time to rethink the White House press office? For example, does CNN really deserve a seat after being caught colluding with the, with the Clinton campaign? Does NBC deserve a seat in the White House press office and, and dealing with the press secretary when we know they have an institutional bias? Or is it time to just throw them all out and start over? Well, those are two different questions. Let me say, first of all, about Taiwan. This was a deliberate, well-thought-out, specific signal. He accepted a phone call from the freely elected head of a democracy of 23 million people. Uh, and frankly, if, uh, if it's okay for President Obama to, to go down and hang out with the Castro dictatorship, it ought to be okay for Donald Trump to talk to a democracy. And he's also sending a very tough signal to Beijing. This ain't the old order. We're not going to let you push us around. You don't dictate to us. Setting the stage for some very, very important negotiations. In terms of the White House press office, I'd like to rethink it from the ground up. It ought to be the American people's press office. We ought to use things like Facebook, like Twitter, a variety of other opportunities to let, for, for one thing, reporters from all over the country ask questions, to let experts ask questions, and to organize a whole new way of making that office serve not the elite media, you know, not the politicians, I, listen, but serve the American people. It, it, when Rudy Giuliani was mayor, he used to do a radio show every week and take calls from city residents. I, I'd offer my 550 right. radio stations, and this, my show, let them take calls from people around the country. Right? And if the New York Times gets think, through, God yeah, bless them. <laughs> I somehow think they're not going to get through often on your show. But... <laughs> No, I think but, but you're, you've got the right idea, which is the, the, this was not designed to be the news media's office. That's what this was become. designed to be a way for the President of the United States to communicate with the people. And it's become a place where the filter of the news media in many ways distorts and blocks the ability to communicate directly to the American people. And I think it would be very useful to rethink it from the ground up and not assume anything about what we've inherited from the past. And it's become such a, a fake dog and phony pony show uh, between the press secretary and the media and the hostility in that room. It's just, it's frankly a waste of everybody's time. Mr. Speaker, good to see you. Thank you.